and welcome back to Beer with Nat. On every episode, I share a beer and a chat with people who do what they love for a living. They work in the beer industry. Today's guest is Ellie Walsh, General Manager at Brewdog Canary Wharf. Ellie tells us what it takes to run a bar, how her uni studies in filmmaking are surprisingly relevant to her role today, what she enjoys most about being a part of the beer industry, and a whole lot more. Here she is. I've brought Perennial Punnet by Overworks. So Overworks is the kind of, well, it's not new sour facility anymore. New Brewdog. to me. New to so you. So I'm excited yeah. to try it. Um, and it's fronted by Richard Kilcullen. Okay. So X Wicked Weed. Okay. That's so, exciting. Yeah, it's really, really good. It um, smells amazing. It's delicious. So it's like a um, uh, sour, wild fermented uh, Scottish ale. Okay. With I get lots of nice, yeah, yeah, like fruity yeah. notes. Yeah. I wasn't going to say tropical, but something like red yeah. berry, that sort of thing. And like a little bit floral as well. The best thing about it is they use, they've spent like, Overworks was like not rushed. So there was a lot of development in the back end of it. So they have um, their own house culture actually as well, which okay. is used across all the board, which is called Share Me. Okay. Um, so what it has like mean? a little Where bit of fun. from? I'm not sure. But you just know that just that's know a cool that, name. Uh, yeah. And I can kind of like smell it in things and go, oh, that smells. That's the house that culture. That familiar. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a really cool project. And I think when Richard was at the, he was at the AGM two years ago, re- representing Wicked Weed. And that's when it was announced that he was leaving. And it was shortly after that, that Wicked Weed were bought. Acquired. Okay. Acquired. Yeah. Yeah. So that all makes sense now when you look back at the timeline, you're like, oh. he had his next step lined up. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, and it's really cool. Um, there's a low. There's a lot more like releases happening now because a lot of the original um, beers are now ready. And yeah. Been it just packaged. takes so much time yeah. Yeah. to make a um, sour, so wild fermented beer. Yeah. Exactly. So it's kind of like a bit of a labour of love, but it's um, pretty cool. We've had this one. We've had one called Kiwi Cavalcade. Um, it's definitely very tart. Right. But the Kiwi Cavalcade one is a lot tart, but this one is a little bit more mellow, yeah. um, for sure. So that's why I like it, because I love sours, but when you drink really, really tart boys all the time, you get Yeah, you're for that, the face starts yeah. hurting. Yeah, yeah. and the indigestion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I didn't bring any ready it. today, so... Uh, <laughs> so we had to, be... to tone down the acidity slightly yeah. this morning. Yeah, I will say, we are recording quite early before Ellie starts her work day, so this is a good breakfast beer. Mm-hmm. It's just like a grapefruit juice or something. It is, with a little bit more zinc. And only a tiny taste. Only a tiny taste. We're being responsible. Uh, Okay, so I'm here on location at Brewdog Canary Wharf, uh, where you are the general manager. You've been here for about the last six months or so, but you've been with Brewdog since April of 2018, where you started as assistant manager at the Tower Hill site. I think a lot of people outside of beer think that Being a bar manager is like living the dream. You've got beer at your fingertips all the time, but it's really hard work. So I would love to hear from you what your day-to-day looks like as a GM. And I've got plenty more questions about all those other hidden things that are part of your job that no one talks about. Um, It's kind of hard to say what the actual day is. I mean, you turn up, you wake up every day and you go, right, my main priorities for the day, regardless of what happens, are run a venue that has a safe, happy team and customers um, that you know, is well looked after and sells a great product, all of your beer is well looked after. And then after that, like it can be any sort of number of things. So what's gonna come up. Exactly, so once that's the the way kind of I approach it, those are like the two main things that I think of every day, regardless of what happens. I like that, here's my mission, big picture. Here's my big picture. And there's gonna be lots of tiny things that get in the way of that. Oh God, yeah. (laughs) Um, So I think you can, you can expect like the day-to-day running and obviously it's a bit different being a general manager of like a bigger venue. Um, you've got a lot more support at your disposal. So that was uh, one of the things that I quite like about, while it might be a bit daunting to have a bigger venue and a bigger team, you, you have a little bit more of a support network in the form of like a management team. Yeah, so the last time I was a general manager, I was the general the manager and that was it. Um, so that's kind of nice because no matter what happens throughout the day, you You've have got people to rely on yeah exactly yeah. um but yeah no day is ever the same i mean obviously you go come in you set up you make sure the venue is running well but the beauty of working in bars as well is that you work with people so depending on what kind of day your team and your people are having that can also like add affect your day as yeah, well. yeah yeah so the goal is wake up open the business have happy safe team and customers throughout the day sell beer talk about beer close the business, repeat. Yep. But that sounds really easy, but it's, it's really not like that. So yeah. for example, we have 
you know like maintenance you have a venue where you have like i think our capacity can be anything up to like 250 300 people holy moly so when and you have that do you hit those numbers yeah, yeah, yeah. it's quite a busy there's it's so many big. businesses around here yeah. yeah so we're pretty much on this side of the of the wharf the um one of like the only sort of like bars i guess there yeah. is like another restaurant that is a little bit more fine dining there's yeah. cafes and stuff like that so we get a lot of footfall regularly yeah. and that means no matter how new a venue is so we're like less than eight months old and um, you're still gonna have maintenance problems because you have high volume usage of your toilets yeah. of your sinks yeah. of your like glass washers your glass your, washers your, exactly yeah. so that those little bits always crop up on a yeah. daily basis where you go damn it i've just had those serviced and and probably on a particularly busy day exactly that, that you really don't want something like that to happen yeah. and that's when it my worst my worst shift here and it's not even like i've had much worse shifts was a uh, friday night when both of our glass washers decided to pack in <sighs> yeah that's <laughs> a nightmare i still just w- remember the mountain of glassware yeah. and we like did you it, have to do them by hand oh yeah. yeah we had like three guys in in the in yeah. the back back of house just like yeah because um, you need to get those back out again oh god yeah because you can't and then people are looking at you going oh why are you taking so long to wash glasses and i'm like well what do you drink your beer out of yeah the glasses and we have no other facility to exactly get um so yeah bits like that can come along but in general i don't want to curse it now but here <laughs> here on a day-to-day basis things if you look good. at like seven days a week there's maybe one day where things a little haywire happens yeah yeah, yeah. um but overall it's quite manageable manageable yeah and okay. i think that that comes from who you work with and also your own approach to being a general manager so yeah. how you choose to look at things I guess. Yeah. yeah and you were at a different venue when you were an assistant manager you were at tower hill but yeah. what was that transition like from assistant manager to general manager what new responsibilities have you taken on um quite a lot so it's been i was a general manager before outside of brew dog um it was a like a small group of four independent pubs again very craft beer focused um but more like neighborhood pub vibe mm-hmm. so nowhere near the amount of people and people and volume new beers and, and exactly yeah. um so i actually kind of took a bit of like a step down to go back in as an am as an assistant manager but when you look at the size of tower hill that's a venue that is probably about six times the size of this one is it that much Mm. bigger oh my goodness especially because they've got the brewery exactly um so my aim was to always work towards managing large venues so going in at an am it gives you a little bit of a cushion because you're there to essentially support uh general managers and deputy general managers in achieving their jobs Mm -hmm. um while also just being able to learn and like the onus isn't on you the book doesn't stop with you as an assistant manager so you can kind of relax into it um learn and i essentially just absorbed everything everything um and at the time the the general manager that was there he no longer works at the company he was a very like driven businessman um and i learned a lot from him but i also learned the type of general manager i didn't want to be mm. that was a huge eye opener is having that cushion to be able to witness someone else doing a job that you kind of you think you might you want you think you want you just and you test think you're probably a already a little bit ready for but yeah. i was essentially kind of time to take a bit of a break personally because yeah. i'd thrown myself into work and i was like i would like a little bit less responsibility yeah. and a little bit more of a relaxed role but tower yeah, hill so was great yeah. knowing you wanted to advance in this business as yeah. well it's a great way to learn sort of the house oh God, style yeah. and the culture and yeah the management um, and expected. the culture is a huge thing so the the like in terms of how we hire and how i would hire as well and the sort of like approach to hiring is um culture is super important so you can i've done interviews with loads of people to join us here and they've been absolutely like no more than me about beer and i'm like Mm -hmm. dazzled by them but in terms of how teams work and our guests and like what they expect in the company culture if you're not the correct fit for like company culture like brew dogs yeah then we're gonna we're gonna probably pick someone else because you can teach beer about beer yeah if you want to learn about beer you can teach it what you can't teach is like really good people service skills or service or yeah. want to give service yeah because like god knows some days i wake up and i'm like oh god i work in the hospitality industry and i have to put your face on put your face energy, on and do yeah. like the production the show yeah. from like open to close um so that is a huge skill working in hospitality and anyone that can wake up and do that every single day consistently 
they is a unique the type of person oh, gotcha. that you need in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I did want to ask that. Does the beer knowledge matter as much as the hospitality skills these days? But it seems it's the hospitality needs to come first, yeah. and then the beer can be taught. Yeah. I mean, like we, d in terms of brewdog, we do we like invest a lot of time and in money education. in training and yeah. educating the team. So that is always there, and the support is always there. But it is a simple thing like you can't teach someone to give a, a guest a memorable experience. You either have that want or you know awareness of yeah, people in perhaps you. from an experience you've had before exactly that you want to recreate for someone. exactly so that's kind of what I look for and I know yeah. that a lot of other general managers and in, in general I think in the business that's what we need people that are passionate about the people that come through the door yeah you can be passionate about beer that's great if you're both oh my god perfect yeah if you know anyone just send them my way like, <laughs> yeah in but yeah the beer you can always learn yeah um and you just want you need to want to learn yeah and that's kind of it so when it comes to your understanding of managing people yeah. have you had any training in management it's very difficult to get the best out of people or is that something that you've learned on the job throughout your different management experiences I always look at in terms of my own journey as like a manager in uh, basing it on how I was managed mm. before I was a manager so I always look at those two key managers in my entire journey journey um and not for positive reasons okay um so i would always try and like juxtapose that and think about how those situations made me feel and how they affected my performance mm -hmm. um and have a look at it it is difficult though because you i've not had any formal training in it mm -hmm. um but my university days i studied film production so mm -hmm. that is essentially big project management yeah that's from a good start point. to finish right and you're yeah. managing um a department or a team of people yeah, so the people producing those different assets pulling it, them together exactly. creating that same vision that everyone's it's working a different towards. end product it's a more like creative visual end product but at yeah. the same the production behind it and what it takes is pretty similar to opening and running a venue because you have people that are allocated different responsibilities you expect different results everyone brings something different to the table and at yeah. the end of it you have a result whether it's a, a beer or a movie or a, yeah you know and that's why i love doing this podcast who would have thought that film production exactly would be it's really so weird. relevant yeah it's really really weird um, and that's kind of how i figured out i figured out quite i was involved a lot of, in a lot of volunteering and um what's the, what's the best way to describe it like student politics and activism I, I did that too i was on our student chair of the student government yeah those sorts of things exactly yeah. um and that's where you just kind of learn how to like read people and motivate yeah. people and deal with difficult people um deal with great people i guess i've just spent most of my life exposed to like different types of people because i've put mm -hmm. myself in different situations i do try and you know do some reading and like there is training in Brewdog in terms of management and yep. support and stuff like that but up until this point working for other companies before Brewdog it has just been sort of like a bit of a analyzing your own experience yeah analyzing your own experience and like manage and lead people how you would like to be led mm -hmm. but again people are people and different people react different ways to different types of leadership so yeah. you have to just be open to leading with the best of intentions but then also being open to any sort of feedback that people give yeah you know valid constructive feedback not yeah. someone just going oh, i don't like you yeah that's not uh, very helpful that's not very helpful but yeah. yeah when um a lot of the time i ask especially like the other managers in the management team here and even the staff like how they're feeling about things and how they feel about how the business runs and are there any suggestions that they think could make things better um, mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff and that's the only way that you're going to ever really have a happy team of people you can't be sitting in like a an ivory tower going well this is how i want to run the business yeah. it's managing um, bottom up and top down yeah, yeah because you're not everyone. the only person in this business yeah if i like i'm not the one serving pints or serving food or taking in deliveries i'm not the only one yeah if it was just me i could run it whatever yeah. way i wanted but exactly. you're but like you said, you like the support of that team. Exactly. So it's yeah. Like keeping yeah. Them happy yeah. It's, well. it's a. It has to be like a healthy symbiotic relationship where yeah. everyone gets something out of it, and everyone, regardless of like their personal goals or whatever, is aligned to this being a happy, successful business. Yeah. And if there's, a, if you don't have that, you, that sort of mentality, I don't think you should be managing people. Yeah. Um. If you want to manage people from top down and you want it to be done your way. Don't get me wrong, things would be a lot easier if I went and said, yeah. um, if you could just do it the way that I would like you to do it, that would be very helpful and much but that's easier. Not but the that's the team you want to be on or no, the team you want to no, leave. Because I've been there and it's not a nice place to be. Yeah. No. Right? So you're not going to get the best out of people? No. You're just going to frustrate people, um, possibly upset people, and then 
lose people. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go back to your uni days when you studied film production. Yeah. What was the plan then? What did you think you were going to do with it? Uh, and then take me up to getting to where you are now. Ugh, it's You've feels had several really, different, you know, stops along the way. It feels really so. weird thinking about it because it was pretty much, I graduated in 14, 2013, 2014. Okay. So yeah, I studied film production. It was four years and it was a very um, hands-on approach. So it wasn't a very academic, it was 50% like academic um, and then 50% practical. So it meant from one week sitting in um, a psychology lecture looking at uh, body language, oh, but like in film yeah. and how you create characters and like pe people on screen that your audience identify with or okay. you know all that sort of stuff and um, like semiotics audience studies so a lot of stuff like that right away i'm seeing how that's relevant here exactly you see how someone walks into the bar and are they in exactly. a place to chat are they you know is there something else going on yeah okay um, and that sort of helped me kind of develop just think about people in a critical way not a bad way but like yeah. you know, look at them objectively and go what is this person got going on right now yep. are they frustrated are they happy what does their body language say to me so there was that aspect of the degree and obviously like creative writing and all that sort of stuff and then there was the the practical practical which was actually being on spending 12 hours a day on a freezing cold set um wrangling loads of gear from one place to another um taking like 20 20 takes to get one 30 second shot i'm not hearing super fond memories at um, this time. I, I actually i actually almost contracted pneumonia in my oh. third year from doing from doing a shoot it was great Holy and you have me. this sense of satisfaction when you see like the finished product and you know yeah. the amount of hours that have gone into it yeah that end of it being on set and having to manage teams so my aim was always i did like writing and directing okay so the plan yeah my next plan was to kind of pursue that um but like film industry and creative industries in general are notorious for being very tough to start out on but I did I was like I'll do it um I moved to London I worked for a year after I graduated saved up loads of money so well, that's what brought you money. from Dublin yeah to, to London. London and then was like right let's do it I used to spend like nine hours a day applying for internships and going through all of these mad processes only to be told great yeah we'll take you on but we want you to work like a 40 hour week and, and we we'll pay, pay your expenses and buy you lunch every day that's really not that doesn't pay your rent in London no no especially not in London which yeah. is so bizarre and I, I recently spoke to one of the one of the guys that was in my year and I was like there was 40 of us so it was a very small group because it was very hands-on and I was like how many of us are actually in the film industry yeah and she was like I think about seven Wow, seven out of forty. The best one I've heard is um one of one of the one of the guys is now works in airport security and just loves life. And I was like, well, that's not something you would have known when we were doing semiotics exactly. in second year of uni. Well, I studied public health, and here I am talking about beer. So exactly, you never know it's like you're gonna end up. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was that. And while I was in uni, obviously I had to fund my way through uni. So that's when I started working in like bars and restaurants. At one stage, I had three jobs. Um, yeah so I was a barista in like a late night cafe um waiter and a bartender um on like weekends and then throughout the day I actually worked for the uni so I was like an elected okay. representative for like students so would like chair meetings attend meetings on behalf of the student body exactly that sort of all that sort okay. of stuff with the university and that was pretty hectic but in that time I started working for a uh, uh, restaurant called pit bros and that was my introduction to craft beer so they were the first so obviously barbecue joints popped up everywhere now but they were the first um restaurant in dublin to do like proper like low and slow Ooh. so they had massive Making like me hungry oh god it was so good <laughs> I, I was a vegetarian before I went to work for them and then I went to work oh for them my and goodness. I was like, so it oh. was that good. Okay. Yeah, it was delicious. Big smokers from like uh, North Carolina, they imported them. Like the brisket would be like 12 hours minimum, oh, like all rubbed like every three hours and it was so good. But they had a really, really good bottled lineup of American craft beers. Um, and that was the first time because Ireland in, and it's still a little well it's not the same now obviously I haven't lived there probably for mm -hmm. four years but in terms of um, the market and what's available um, it's a little bit tricky because obviously there's a lot of um, influence from like Diageo and like the big drinks joints because yeah. unlike the UK there's not the same like anti-competitive laws and 
they can get away with a lot more yeah, in Ireland. So it's a lot of Guinness and a lot of Heineken. Yes. And it's harder for other brands to yeah. break in. Um, so it was always really weird when you saw like, oh, what's that funny looking bottle of beer in the corner okay. of the fridge? So these guys You had... tune into it a little bit more. Yeah, you're yeah. like, oh, what is that? And it was nothing really exciting, to be honest. Now, looking back at it, I'm like, huh, that's just pretty standard day but like likes like sierra nevada pale ale yeah like anita's still a mainstay though oh yeah. god yeah it's still delicious yeah um but now it wouldn't blow my mind exactly and then i was like oh what's this and i yeah. remember the first time i had a bottle of sierra nevada pale ale and i was just like oh my god this tastes like soap what is this <laughs> um and the guys were all laughing at me and they were like yeah it does taste a bit weird but it definitely tastes better than Heineken, doesn't it and then i was you like you soon learn to adjust your palate and exactly learn to love it. so that was the introduction and i must say i was a bit wary of it i was a bit like oh god i could only have one of those mm. but then it combined with the food was like the perfect match yeah um so slowly my mainstay then moved to <laughs> the food you ate and the drinks you drank yeah. changed at the same time exactly yeah. um and I think there wasn't really any looking back from that ever since that sort of instance. I was like, oh, beer can taste different. Okay, let's pick the weirdest bottle in the fridge. So I had a bottle of Duvel once and I yep. was, my mind was just like, oh my God. My mouth was like, what is this? What is going on? Exactly. Why is this so strong? But it doesn't taste that strong. Yeah, yeah. like, why am I drunk already? I had <laughs> two. Um, and yeah, so that sort of like sparked a bit of a curiosity that kind of stuck with me. Um, and then obviously moving to London, that was like mind blowing. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. If you thought Dublin selection was growing, you come to the selection here. And I worked, my first few hospitality jobs in London were just um, mainly wait, like waitressing. Um, and then I worked for uh, Deshoom for a while oh, okay. and they brew their own uh, Mondo Brewing contract brew their IPA. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember having that and being like, okay, cool, this is this is a thing here too. No way. Um, and then after that, I just started looking for, I met a few people from the industry who were really into beer, mm -hmm. started hanging out with them. Obviously then you're influenced to go and drink in different places and yep. be exposed to different things. And Your network grows bit by bit. Exactly. Um, and the, like, the craft beer industry and community in London is probably why I'm still here before I met like in my first like six to eight months in London it was very lonely because mm. um, hospitality can be pretty much like you get up you do a double shift you go home you're almost um, doing the wrong hours from everyone else yeah if you don't have a hospitality network yeah it's super like not social and the type of places where I was working it's like big high volume restaurants and like at the end of the night everyone just wants to go and get messed up um and if you're the one opening the next morning yeah exactly you can't do that um so that was not kind of in those types of environments I find it quite difficult to like make friends or like people to socialize with because I didn't want to go and get messed up mm -hmm. I wanted to like sit and have a couple of beers and so like exploring and meeting a few people and like going to bottle shops and stuff like that in where I lived was kind of my way of socializing mm -hmm. big shout out to like Hot Burns and Black they were like one of my first bottle shops and that was like a new introduction to me in like a new way to like drink and enjoy alcohol mm -hmm. without having to go and get messed up so yeah beer and that sort of community and different like tap rooms and bottle shops was like where I gravitated towards and then yeah. that obviously opens up loads more things to taste so yeah that's kind of how I so you got socialized. your start in the London beer scene in a pub here. Yes. And then you moved to Gosnell's Mead, is yes. that correct, in yeah. a sales role? Yeah. So that was your first foray into the industry outside of pubs. Yes. What was that experience like? So this is a South London meadery who make their mead in a way that's sort of similar to beer. Yeah. So it's um, so they use honey as their main fermentable. Exactly. As to malt. But and it's they bottled. Kind of packaging it in the same way and sell it into the same sorts yeah. of places. Yeah. So it was like a lower, a lot of meads traditionally, like if you look at the likes of like scrams and superstition and stuff like that in the States, um, mead is a lot stronger foothold and they make these really big high ABV like sippers almost yeah They're yeah like you wouldn't and syrupy and you just slowly enjoy them exactly whereas um but Gosnell's the, is quite different yeah the whole approach from like Tom and the team there is to make it more mainstream so like bring the ABV down um make it a little bit sparkling so it's not as like um viscous or mm -hmm. like heavy um, almost heavy exactly and make it try and make it more of like an everyday drink almost like a gateway into getting people to explore mead so that was really cool and that was the reason why I, I went with it because I was like oh, just on my discovery of new beer and then my friends were like why are you going to work for someone that makes mead then and I was like yeah but it's like the concept and it's really exciting because 
you have to talk to people who don't know what mead is or have never had a mead so mm-hmm. like trying to find that language was really really great and try and make it accessible to everyone so everyone at this stage would know what like a pale ale or an ipa is yep. how do you explain mead to someone a other totally than a totally new concept yeah because yeah. people always go oh it's like it's wine and i'm like well it's not, it's not quite wine but yeah you're on, on the <laughs> there's path. something similar there's something similar or oh it's like cider I mean, it, it has some similarities. You're trying to like find... So that was good practice to yeah. learn a new language, to communicate oh, about God, yeah. a and product it's... that people don't really know. It yeah. almost probably made it easier to come back to beer because there's much more familiarity Yeah, there's a, there's a bigger vocabulary yeah. now when you're describing a beer or a different style of beer or there's different... There's more other beers to reference. Be yeah. like, have you ever had X? It's this is similar. similar to it. Yeah, yeah whereas okay. with mead, it's like... Have you had honey? Have you had honey before? <laughs> yes. Okay. There's a similarity. There's a similarity there. You're going to taste it. Um, so that was really good. And so I'd been the general manager of uh, that bar. And that was really cool. It was like 20 lines. Um, and I could literally fill it with what I wanted. I did some really cool events there. I got to do like, um, what was the best one? Like dry and bitter before dry and bitter were really big Became in big the deal. UK. Yeah. And like all that sort of stuff. And that kind of really honed in my love for beer. Yeah. Um, and and it, where was that? What pub that was in um, the Bear in Camberwell. Okay. So it's closed now due to landlord issues. They oh, think they took okay. back the premises to turn it into flats, oh, which is happening a lot across the city at the minute. Different pubs, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a shame. Um, so I did like 17 months there and then moved to Gosnells. Mm-hmm. Um, it was great because at the time I thought, oh God, I've always worked in hospitality pretty much since I've left uni. Um, it's pretty hardcore. Being a general manager there was a lot harder so I do like 70 hours a week pretty much on average because again like I mentioned before I was the only one it was just me and then the team that works in the bar so I was like I need something that's a bit more sociable yeah um and the Gosnell's jobs was great because it was I mean unless we had events like during like the summer season the weekends we'd be out and doing events or you might have a few events in the evenings but I was still getting home before 1am yeah you know um and that to me was like oh novelty what a revolution yeah i was like yeah. oh my god is this what it feels like to have sleep? time to yourself yeah, yeah what is this um and it's really weird because in that time i went vegan for like a few months and i was like i'd never be able to do this because i never had the time before yeah. and now i have the time um, but yeah that's a bit of a side note but the working for gosnells was really good but it also kind of reaffirmed for me that i felt my like heart and talents belonged in bars okay um i really enjoyed it I met some really great people and again because it was uh, was managing accounts of like distributors like beer craft and all that sort of stuff so you're still in the circles yeah, for beer and sure in it's London. it's so helpful to see that side oh, yeah. when sales reps come into you yeah. you can say yep I've been on that side I yeah. know the pitch you're about to make and sort of how this works yeah. and what it works um, and I'm also always really aware of how to treat sales reps because yeah. I've been one and I've been to it was also quite eye-opening I've had quite a few venues in London that I actually won't drink in because you've um, had bad because experiences of, yeah, um, in terms of a sales rep and I think everyone in the industry needs to just be a bit kinder to sales reps mm. because unless you've been there and you've had to go through and call like maybe 50 people who have no interest in talking to you it is part of your job unfortunately yeah. Um, so yeah just always be nice and always offer someone a drink. It's yeah. literally so. It's like as simple as that. I've, so many times I've gone into bars where everyone's like, "Oh, it's such a great venue," and um, like to socialise in. Like they're really their hospitality is ace. Their team are great. They know a lot about beer. If you go in as a sales rep, it's a completely different welcome. You get none of that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so that's kind of a, a rule that I live by, and I try and get the the other guys to kind of do the same thing Again, if you know someone taking experiences that have yeah. been unpleasant and yeah, adjusting your attitude. Yeah for your um, team as well here completely because yeah. it's it's a tough job and again i figured oh. out that it wasn't for me yep um i did get some really cool opportunities and i got to do some like mead and food pairings and like some really cool events and stuff like that but i needed to get back into bars yeah um, i needed that like challenge i needed to be part of a bigger team of people and yeah just something a bit more challenging and like lively in a different way yeah um and i it was it was quite hard going back though because i went from having really nice hours for nine months to then going back and i remember my latest close in tower hill was like 4 (gasps) a.m because we had a a massive night and it's a massive venue and i remember just sitting at the bus stop on the way home and this was like maybe two months in going did i make the wrong decision going (laughs) back to bars and then i woke up the next day and looked at how the team performed how great of a night it was and how great everyone had and i just went nah I'm good. I'm oh, good here. Good. Yeah. And that's how I ended up back in Tower Hill. Yeah. And so why Brewdog? What brought you to Brewdog? Uh, it's a bit of a weird one, right? So obviously 
before Brewdog, I did also work for like Kill the Cat. Yep. So it's like a small independent bottle shop. So all of my experience in terms of like the craft beer industry in London up until Brewdog would have pointed me in probably going in any other direction opposite to Brewdog. Sort of small independent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I met Josh. Um, so he used to brew at Four Pure. Okay. And then he was actually going to be taken on the brew pub at Tower Hill. Uh, so we okay. met socially just and we were just chatting yeah. yeah and he was like oh there's this really cool thing coming up with like brewdog because he had worked with brewdog previously before four pure mm-hmm. and um he was like look i think you should just like apply for it like go for an interview and like suss it out and see what you think because at the time i was like i want to get back into bars and i did it and i did i didn't really think about it i wasn't in like an urgent place where i was like i need to leave gosnell's now just i was like a job any job yeah biting yeah kind of like biding my time having a bit of a feel for it um, and I went to the interview and I really enjoyed the interview so two of the ops managers interviewed me and it was like I think it was about an hour and a half long wow, of an that's interview. A long interview but it didn't feel like an interview it was more of like a conversation right yeah. so that was obviously a, a good a sign good to me and then after that the um the head of retail was also in the bar where I was being interviewed so they were like okay we think we should go have a chat with him and just having a chat with him um, his name's James Brown JB about like the company and what their plans were for like the next few years and all of like the expansion it like triggered something in my brain was like this is really exciting and this is something that I kind of want to be a part of so yeah it triggered something and then I was like okay let's go for it I've got nothing to lose the position in terms of being an assistant manager is something that I know I'm capable enough of anyway so I wasn't worried about any of that yeah Um, and then it turns out I got off the job anyway so I looked at it and to be honest, quite a few people that I was friends with in like the beer industry gave me quite a bit of shit when they found out that they were I was like going to go work for Brewdog. One close friend in particular, I literally just turned around and sent them my job offer. And I said, can you tell me right now that it would be a very smart thing to like reject this? And it was the first, like Brewdog's a great company to work for. And it's like, I know there's a lot of different stories about it but in terms of my experience this is the first job that I've had in hospitality even at an assistant manager level where I had like healthcare support mm. and really basic stuff like that um, and that Just was all included in my things where off- you know you're being taken care of exactly as an employee. and that that pretty much shut them up they were like oh wow I didn't know that that's part of the package of working you're getting from- that kind of support exactly yeah so I took it and still copped a bit of flack from from some other people, people. From other yeah. people and went into it and the obviously tower hill is like uh, the flagship brew pub so it was the first brew pub opened by the company yeah and um, it took a lot of training and a lot of work before opening so being involved with that and just working with ned is kind of heads up the L and like training on the ground training for all the bars like every bar pretty much wow and he is probably one of the most infectious and like inspirational people to be in a room with when you're working on like a big project and obviously that was that triggered something in my brain as well and I was like I like the approach and the care given into like training and developing people that was even shown in the first two weeks on the job Mm -hmm. and it's something that has continued so you know the way you obviously think like at the start of a job they're gonna keep you happy yeah exactly and that sort of um approach to like development and training carries yeah carries carries right right through and then yeah I spent I think I was in Tower Hill for four months and then I got a really great surprise where um my boss at the time turned around and was like you can't have your holiday in July and I was like um rage absolute rage because I hadn't taken any time off I was like well why can't I not have my holiday in July mister and he was like cause we're sending you to Korea um yeah and I got sent to Korea yeah Yeah. so I want to hear everything about this I know I saw some of your pictures from when you were there so what the heck brought you to Korea what was that like and how does that market compare to the UK so Brewdog opened the second brew pub so the second ever brew pub in the history of the company was in uh, Seoul in Korea and ah so because you'd got your start at tower hill yeah you were the right person yeah. to go out there okay so i was sent out for a month um and it was uh, kind of two weeks before opening so like a lot of pre-opening support working with like um one of the heads of the food team mm-hmm. to help train like kitchen and then working with the general manager there just a, again a lot of the training that we had done ahead of opening tower hill in terms of like people the culture what the company's about what the brand's about but it was very challenging because i don't speak korean yeah so it's a bit of a language barrier yeah but most of the team there understood english but didn't speak okay. it very well okay so 
it was quite difficult to land like that one way communication yeah yeah um and but that to be honest is probably one of the most valuable things I learned because it it made me look at how I communicate with people Mm. um and you have to when you have that sort of language barrier you have to be in like completely clear there has to be no like nuances to what you're saying there has to be and you kind of almost have to be direct but also um like Korean culture and a lot of Asian culture is very uh you have to be a lot polite Mm -hmm. so it's balancing getting the information out as clear as you need it but also being polite and respectful yeah with pleasantries and all that sort of stuff so that was a huge challenge and I was there yeah the two weeks beforehand to get the venue open and then we opened the venue and I was there for the second two weeks to kind of assist in how it ran and getting all like the general manager there it trained on like the systems that we use Mm -hmm. because we've like different uh, staff management systems and all that sort of stuff it was bizarre uh, the market there is really, really weird. Belgian beer is everywhere. Ah, oh, yes. Duval, listen in. <laughs> Literally, Belgian beer is everywhere, and I think it's because obviously it travels well. Yeah. So it's a okay. lot of bottled and quite a bit of draft. But yeah, you could go into any beer that says that it's a craft beer bar, and you'll find Belgian beers. Yeah, like I had um, the lovely Duchess on draft in three oh. separate venues in Korea, which is something I never thought. Which I would you don't see. really find here. Yeah. Exactly. And it was like, oh my god, I've hit the jackpot. Yeah. But even though the like um, Korean customer's understanding of it is probably not as in depth. Yeah. As like the European understanding of it they enjoy the flavors and they like because obviously again korea in terms of like the whole market is dominated by your cast light which is the equivalent of like bud light okay which is you know your mainstream lager so in general every single bar restaurant you get will have your mainstream lager exactly but not something as interesting yeah so people love belgian beer Okay. which is a great place to start if you're going to get into craft beer, right? Yeah, because true. it has a variety of flavours, styles, different colours. It's not just like different variations of an IPA. Of hops. Yeah, yeah, of hops, right. Um, and another thing that was really, really weird was, for me anyway, going into these venues that were more craft beer focused, more women drinking mm. than men. Wow. Yeah. Okay, that's good to see. It's strange, but... yeah made me feel really at ease and I actually quite enjoyed going out drinking there um obviously I wouldn't go out a lot because I was working a lot yeah. but when you'd finish in the evening the nightlife there also starts a lot later and finishes a lot later okay. so it's more normal to go out at 11 p.m mm-hmm. and stay out till like 4 a.m because of oh, the not heat farewell and, there yeah I'm gonna bed too early for um <laughs> yeah I struggled real hard I was like sitting in a bar at 2 a.m being like I could definitely have another point but I'm going home <laughs> but I need to be in bed but now. I need to be in bed but yeah you'd see large groups of women drinking in like craft beer venues with the more interesting glassware mm-hmm. and like you could tell it was like an imperial stout by like the serve and the color or a barley wine or a double or like and then you'd see their male counterparts sitting at the same table with a pint of cast light mm. so that was really really refreshing and then yeah you've also got like um Goose Island have an established brew pub there, which is very impressive. I didn't know that. Very impressive. So you've got that going on. So the American influence, um, you've got McKellar have a cafe. There is quite a lot of... um, A big craft beer presence now too. Yeah, but it's growing more organically. Like there's a lot more um, tap rooms and brew pubs now opening from Korean breweries as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And to be honest, I went into it going, oh, they've not been doing it as long as the Americans. I'm not going to be impressed. Some of the beers that I had from the Korean um, and like soul based producers some of the best beers I've had in a while wow. and they do sours really well Okay. really really well um, so there's a, a brewery called Wild Wave and they do um, the, kind of like the most well known sour Korean sour is called like Sur Lame Okay. I could drink that like all day um, and that was super surprising and I might have to add that to my next beercation list to go to Korea <laughs> yeah really really good and you've got like um there's Magpie Brewing they're based on Jeju Island but they have a bottle shop in Seoul and a cafe where they do like pizza so that was I was I was sitting there going I feel like I'm in London yeah so one of the co-fans of that is American okay living in Korea so yeah it's a really surprisingly well developed but still small um, and when you look at the presence of cast and like there's a big um like pilsner or kel and Mm -hmm. you know all that sort of stuff there are quite a few big players um but lots of small um little tap rooms or little brew pubs are quite popular as Mm -hmm. well so it was was very very interesting um yeah it sounds like a great experience beer and food (laughs) food is just amazing as well 
go, do it. I think you need to do All it. All right, it's on my yeah, list now. You do. Okay, you've convinced me. Yeah. Um, so clearly you're, you've are you got to be a good brand ambassador for yeah. BrewDog yeah. and you know a well-respected employee to have been sent out there. BrewDog is often seen as having quite brash marketing, but anyone that I have heard from or spoken to that works for them is really passionate about the brand. So are there any sort of misconceptions you want to dispel or correct from your experience as part of the team yeah I think you kind of have to be super careful about it because like again I can only speak from my experience yeah I've, you don't make the marketing campaigns I don't, yeah um I do see how they're executed and a lot of the time I get to have conversations with the people who may have been behind it and I, I know genuinely that none of those people are like bad people or do things with the intent to like upset or you know disrupt but there clearly is a very unique and distinguished approach that has been established by BrewDog for marketing but also I work in the retail side of the company so I work in the bars where we get a lot of feedback from people on the marketing yeah, because this is where they come the to drink end. yeah, yeah. I think a lot of the misconceptions is, and it obviously it's a lot of people who have may have worked for BrewDog as well, play a part in it that have not had a happy time mm. with BrewDog. And obviously I can't speak for that either, but every day I know that in terms of like Canary Wharf and the environment that we create here and the environment that I'm supported and encouraged in creating from my senior managers and from operations managers up until the director of retail and all that sort of stuff is always a positive one Mm -hmm. and there's so much stuff going on behind the scenes in BrewDog in terms of supporting like employees and ways to do that that I'm not going to speak about because some of it can be a bit you know sensitive and you know all that sort of stuff but that is literally unlike anything I've ever had working for any other company and that's what I will always speak of like I'm not going to say that pink ipa was a great deal that landed well but i don't your I d- experience from, that you can speak to yeah it's like um i think it served to get people talking mm. about it. and you know a lot of marketing is about that and i think the intention was there to highlight that and maybe the, the execution didn't quite follow follow through which happens but obviously brewdog is quite a big company and a big visible company so when you make faux pas they are far more visible but I think in the last even the time that I've been here any conversations that we've had or any conversations that I've been privy to is always very positive and it is about learning and um, like BrewDog hasn't been able to grow at the rate it has grown without listening to feedback like feedback from people on the brand or feedback from our guests that directs what I do Mm -hmm. you know I mean that's one of the first things I check every morning is have we had any like feedback positive or negative and I pass it on to the team so you don't exist in like a in in a bubble bubble. um and yeah I run most of the business based on like feedback from different people um obviously how I want to run it but yeah feedback is kind of king even if you don't like it yeah um it still means you've either failed to land something or you need to have a bit of a rethink and then you get positive feedback which reinforces the good things about the business so all I can say is I can speak from my experience and from the start up until now I don't think I've ever worked for another company that has supported me as much encouraged me as much developed me as much or allowed me to do that for other people as well Mm -hmm. and that's that's what I'll always say that's why you're here that's why I'm here yeah so what aspect of your job as GM do you enjoy the most people uh, managing people but it's also the hardest one because like I mentioned earlier the great thing about this industry is it's built by people but also we're not robots so <laughs> dependent on how your day is going or how your personal life is going that can have and because you're expected to turn up and present present and host people and create great memories for them as your guests and your customers if you've not got a solid base personally to work from it can be quite difficult Mm -hmm. so I have I really enjoy being able to like encourage and train and inspire people but it's also quite difficult when you have um, team members that might be going through some stuff and to have to like like see that and want to help but Um, almost know that you can't yeah I mean we can help to a certain extent in terms of like professionally if they need support at work and all that sort of stuff but when you work like you know 10 11 hours a day with people you can't help but not care for them personally and that is also the hardest part about it yeah people is the 
the best bit and probably the, the most bit. challenging bit. The beer as well. Okay, yeah. the beer is a great bit. I've... Well, yeah, that, this might be the same answer yeah. then. So last question, what do you enjoy most about being a part of the beer industry more broadly? The beer. Yeah, there um, we go. That's when yeah, that answer comes in. Um, but also it's not really about the beer itself. It's about like what happens when you sit down to drink a beer with different people. And I think the, like, the sense of community around beer is amazing and it's unlike any i know like cocktail bartenders have their own community or you have like spirits guys and wines like that i've dipped my toe in each of them and decided to dive into beer because Mm. of the type of people that you get not even the type that's the wrong way to say it the openness to all kinds of people that you get that you might not necessarily get in the wine industry yeah or you know yeah, beer brings people together exactly. in a different yeah. way than... Um, so yeah, the beer mind. and what beer... And the people that are the people tracks. Exactly, whether it's like people that work in production, people that work in sales, people that work in bars, people that work in warehousing, people that work in marketing. Like, I've met so many great people and genuinely I don't think I'd still be in London if it wasn't for working and having a social life in, in beer. I don't, I, London's a hard place to live it's super expensive and it can be quite yeah it can be quite lonely at times depending on like where you're based or you know what your social circle is or what support you have and I found I found all of my current people and some of my best friends for life in the beer industry and I've also found a career so best of both best of both yeah so pretty that's much. not a reason to stay yeah I don't know yes yeah. yeah oh amazing thanks so much no problem. Thanks again for having me in, Ellie. It's so great to hear how much the beer industry means to you. Next week, you'll hear from Lily Waite, artist and activist behind the Queer Brewing Project. You don't want to miss it. Chat soon.